Okay, so here is your evolution stations recap. We will be going over stations one through five. So my first question to you is, how do we model evolutionary relationships? So pause the video, think about it, and then I'm going to go over it. So we model evolutionary relationships by making a cladogram, which as you saw in station one, we were simulating um, evolutionary relationships by having a race through the wood, the race through the woods. So we use this analogy with runners and stamps, but then in station three, you should have seen that the runners were actually supposed to represent organisms and the stamps represented different traits. They all had a starting point and they crossed the finish line. You could have done your cladogram two different ways. You could have drawn it like a map or you could have drawn it like a cladogram, just like Bozeman did, um, where it looks like really neat with straight lines and add an angle. So again, these two are equivalent. Personally, this is Ms. Mueller talking, this is easier for me to create um, and also maybe a little bit easier for me to understand. Both of them are equivalent and correct, so it just matters, you know, which one floats your boat. So what are the main parts of a cladogram? You should have done this with station two and have um, labeled that with question three. So here are the main parts. Up top, you have your species of interest, which is present day species. And then going back in time, going to ancestors at every branch point, you have common ancestors. So this means that at this point in time, this these organisms slash species diverged from this species that eventually turned into E present day. Um, you can see different branching points and you can see which ones are more closely related. For example, A is, most, is mostly related to B and least closely related to E. So you should be able to identify the points on these cladograms and to be able to understand relationships. So another way you can think about it is a cladogram being just like a pedigree, only at a larger scale. So here is Queen Victoria, um, who is thought to be a carrier for hemophilia. And you can see how she has led to um, present day royal families. So I believe this is more World War II. Um, here's a Spanish royal family and here's Anastasia. So they may not necessarily be around today, but it's still a really great analogy. Because really a cladogram is just like a pedigree, except it's kind of flipped on its head. You still have the relationships. So I found this really co cool graphic that puts things in terms of like families. So humans um, are very close cousins. Like they might be your 15th cousin. Everyone in this room is related at one point or another, but it may be distantly, but on a very small scale. As you go down, you can see that to a Philippine tarsier, we had a common ancestor with them 68 million years ago, which is equivalent to being 6.7 millionth cousins. Um, humpback whale, we diverged 95 million years ago. That was the last time that we had common parents, if you will, 21 millionth cousin. Um, here is another example. So this is a really cool website. Um, that I want to share with you. Here you can see that humans and platypuses, or platypi, they had a common ancestor that looks somewhat like this, and they that is equivalent to being 100 millionth great-grandparent right here, which makes platypus and humans 101 millionth cousins. Another thing to note, looking at the taxonomy, which we'll be looking at later, notice the similarities. Okay, we have are in the same do, same domain, kingdom, phylum, and class, but then we diverged at these more specific taxa. Here's another example, except with Indian cobras. This was probably somewhat looking like our common ancestor. Again, 146 millionth great grandparent. So great, 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 great to the 146 millionth time. And you can see how our taxonomy is similar. We share the phylum chordata, but after that, we diverged. We branched apart. We had a branching point right here, which led to our classifications being different. So what criterion do we use to gauge evolutionary relatedness? This is a question on your station one. Find it. 
Here's the answer. We use physical appearance, think homology and analogy, molecular comparisons, think DNA, behavioral patterns, if they act similarly, geographic distribution, where they're found, and fossil comparisons, which is comparing to really deceased animals from a long, long time ago. Do they look similar? Did humans evolve from chimpanzees? This is one of the biggest misconceptions about homology, or not homology, about evolution. What did you answer for this one? This is directly from station two. You should have got, heck no. Humans and chimpanzees are both alive today. Therefore, we could not have come from chimpanzees. That's like me saying I came from my cousin. No, no, no. Really, we had a common ancestor that occurred at this branching point according to this cladogram. Here's another one. You can see chimpanzees are right here. They are around present day, and here's Homo sapiens. We had other branching points, but as you can see from these lines, they're stunted, meaning that everything that did not reach this top line, they are extinct. So um, I'm actually reading a book. Um, it's called The Wildlife of Our Bodies. That was a and part of it, they talked about this certain species, which I believe is very similar to Lucy, if you've ever heard of her. My next question, how do you decide if something is analogous or homologous? This is from station four. One way to look at it, you got to look at the relationships. So here we're talking about having kind of streamlined bodies, the correct name for that is called fusiform, and having like being adapted to the water. So as you can see, these guys are adapted to water, but not amphibians, non-whales, and reptiles. You can see that whales, including dolphins, got that trait at a later time. You got to look at the common ancestor. Let's compare bony fishes to whales. They diverged right here. So if you're looking at um, having aquatic bodies, they got that trait at a different time. Here they lost it, here they gained it back. Because the adaptation originated not from the common ancestor, this one originated after the fact, it would be considered analogous. These guys right here, the common ancestor does have that aquatic body, therefore these two have that homologous structure. Here's another comparison. If the ancestor had the same feature, it's homologous. If the common ancestor did not have that trait, it is a no. So you can think about it kind of like as a like little quiz. So ask yourself, did the common ancestor have the trait? If yes, it's homologous. Homo meaning same, came from the same place. If no, the common ancestor did not have that trait, it is analogous. So why is it important? Who cares? What does it matter if something is homologous or analogous? Think about it. Well, here's my question. So birds and mammals both have four chambered hearts. Lizards do not. Lizards do not. So what are birds more closely related to? Mammals or lizards? Well, according to these two cladograms, depending on where you put four chambered heart, it might seem that birds are more closely related to mammals or birds are more closely related to lizards, depending on where you put this four-chambered heart. In this case, birds and mammals having a four-chambered heart is homologous. In this case, birds and mammals having four-chambered heart is analogous. So I believe based on our current research, again, going back those slides, we have many different other ways that we can um, gain evidence for relatedness. I believe, don't quote me, but I believe that this one is the most currently accepted by looking at physical appearance, fossils, and molecular genetics. So it matters because homologous and analogous helps us delineate the correct relationships from one species to another. So why do we classify organisms? What's the point of that taxonomy? Domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. I remember when I was your age, I was like, what does it matter? Who cares? A panda is a panda and doesn't really care what we call it because it's too busy being a panda. And it wasn't until later that I realized why it's important. One reason is it gives us a common language. 
For example, depending on where you are, you might call what we call a mountain lion many different names. Puma, catamount, mountain lion, cougar, all of those things. But if we call it by the scientific name, which is we get because of classification, if you say puma con color, everyone knows what you are talking about. These things, these names are very regional. And I mean, it's kind of like in England, they call the like the hood of a car, like a bonnet. We call it the hood of a car. There's things that are lost in translation. But if we had a common naming system, which is what classification taxonomy are, you're able to communicate better exactly about what you are talking about. It also allows us to confer relationships. For example, by looking at this, looking at the classification, you can see how much things are related. So looking at a dog and a butterfly, they both belong to Kingdom Animalia. But as you can see, as you go down to phylum, that is where their similarities stop. All the way down, you can see that at the more specific taxa or taxonomic classifications, dogs are most closely related to wolves and foxes. They have the most names in common, which means that they are more evolutionarily related. Again, based off all that evidence that we have before, the taxonomy kind of gives you a roadmap for where have things been and who they are most closely related to. So this is a really good optional video that you can look at. Um, because this is video, I can't really hyperlink anything. So I would just Google, you are a fish, and it looks like this. They go into um, cladograms and they go into taxonomy and they do a really good job about summarizing most of the things that I talked about. So if you are confused, I would maybe take three minutes and 35 seconds and do that. So let us know if you have any questions.